Psalm 147 verse 5 says, Great is our Lord, and of great power His understanding is infinite. Now, as you look at this, we we see what I'm talking about when I say His, His absolute attributes inform, define His uh, relative attributes, or as Ben Master puts it, they pour out into that. You see that um, great is our Lord and of great power. Um, the, the word great could be understood to describe the, the infinite nature of God. If you think about the word great in the fullest sense of it, not how it's often used today, uh, something's great, we just mean that was nice or that was good. Uh, but in, in the fullest sense of of great as even the greatest, it would describe God. And we see his power mentioned here, but then his understanding is infinite. It's unending. That he knows all things, that his knowledge, but not just knowledge, but his understanding of those things. Um, and it's it's kind of like, you know, when I was working on the engine, we, we the first thing that we understood was that the spark plugs were bad. And that was true, but that didn't solve the problem because our understanding was, was limited. It's much harder to tell when the coil isn't working than when the spark plug, because the spark plug was all corroded and it was messed up and, and some really understanding, uh, really easy to weigh, easy to see ways. Our understanding is always limited. And not just knowledge, but the understanding, the relationship of it. God's understanding, God's wisdom is infinite. Which means that God always selects the best means to accomplish his ends. Always. That's really what wisdom is. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. It is knowing, not just knowing, but then knowing how to do something, how to accomplish a goal. I used to joke when I was a kid, and we'd be going someplace with my dad. My dad would be driving. My dad was a letter carrier in Lakewood. And as a, someone who delivered the mail, he knew every side road. He had a lot of knowledge. But every time he said, hey, I know a shortcut. And we'd start whipping down side roads. We never got lost, but it was never shorter than the more obvious route either. I used to joke. I said, yeah, this is one of dad's long cuts. And, and he had the knowledge, but not necessarily the wisdom to get to select the best means. His goal was to get there quicker and we always got there, but it was never quicker. Now, that might be a bit of an exaggeration. I'm sure there's sometimes it was quicker. But, you know, you think about uh, when the people of God have been finally released after the, the killing of the firstborn, the Passover event. God, uh, Pharaoh finally says, OK, you guys can go. And the Bible says they left and they went. But Pharaoh observed they took, paraphrasing, the long way. He says they're lost. Now, it wasn't that, that they were lost. They, they might have not been taking the most direct route, but they were taking the route that God wanted them to take. Which brings them to an ultimate victory over Egypt. I think as we, we think about the wisdom of God and, and see this, let's turn over to the, the other reference here. Proverbs 21 verse uh, 22 <clears throat> a wise man scaleth the city of the mighty and casteth down the strength of the confidence thereof. Now, now notice what is being said in this verse, and I'm going to apply it to God, but, but the verse is saying that wisdom can overcome power. Military history, full of Weaker armies with better strategy winning and having the victory. In, in life, just because somebody is strong 
doesn't mean that they are uh, going to have have a victory. I, I see this all the time when Obadiah and Isaiah wrestle. That Obadiah, if you compare them, is is really bigger than Isaiah. Don't tell I, Obadiah or Isaiah I said that. But and yet every time I watch them wrestle, Isaiah wins. Why? Well, he's a little bit more coordinated. He's, he's got a little bit more, if you will, wisdom about him. That, that wisdom is really an undervalued uh, characteristic of, of people. Somebody who's wise can, can accomplish what they want to accomplish. So that when we think about God, we need to remind ourselves of God's wisdom. Um, I don't want to do this. But can we all just agree that 2020 has been a really unusual, strange, frustrating year? We don't need to argue for that. Does anybody want to dispute that, what I just said? You look at some of the things that, that we've had to do, are still having to do, still having to deal with. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned, I, I just, you know, my, my heart breaks for those who want to get together to, to even be with their loved ones at the end. And that that's not happening with the ease and frequency that it should. And, and, you know, debates over, over funerals. We, you know, Tim Hart's funeral that I got to attend to, if that happens one week later, they probably can't have that because of the restrictions that came down from, from their governor. When, when is that happened? And we look at this year and we can say, well, I'm really excited for January 1st, 2021. I'm excited to get through this year. I always love New Year's, but I'm really looking forward to it. But what can we say as the people of God? That God did not make a mistake when planning 2020. That God did not, God was not surprised like we were. God didn't say, hey, I've got a good plan, and then it all fell apart. Uh, sometimes, you know, we make plans, we have plans, and, and it just falls apart, and it turns into a disaster. And say, so why did I even try this? I felt that when I was, you know, to use the illustration of the van. I uh, felt that at one point in the van. We, we took, we disconnected the gas line, which was a real big mistake. We didn't need to do that. And you know what happens when you disconnect the gas line? Gas goes everywhere. The car doesn't start right. Well, you probably shouldn't start it. And then we broke another part that we had to go buy. Thankfully, it was a cheap part. If we had only known what we didn't need to do that, that was on the easy side too, by the way. And we really didn't need to do that. We just needed an extender for the ratchet. It would, would have been much better. That's not our God in any way. The things that we go through are the best means to accomplish God's ends. Very quickly, what is God's end? What what is the goal that God is seeking to accomplish? His glory, glory, and you can quote the catechism, right? His glory and that we would enjoy him forever. We might add to that. uh, Let's do it. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Abby, uh, remind me to add this to the slide later. And then forget all of it because you have to hear it at YC. (laughs) Romans chapter 8. We love, I love, some of you have have caught my love, and maybe you all love it too. Verse verse 28, we can quote it. And we know all things, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good. What is we really need to define though what good is. So you could have said, when I asked you what is God's end, now obviously his glory, number one. Number two, you could have said the good of his people. But a lot of people have a hard time with that because of the question of how do you define good? Living in America in the modern age, generally speaking, people have defined good as being wealthy and healthy. 
Today, it's an even greater emphasis perhaps on a convenient, easy life, is how a lot of people would say, I'm living the good life. The good life is having no cares. The good life is uh, having a full belly. The good life is uh, not having anything to be worried about. Now, I say that, you say, but we're the people of God. We shouldn't have to worry. Agreed. We should not worry. We should trust in God. But the good of verse 28 is very helpfully defined by what Paul says in the very next verse. It says, for whom he foreknew, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So God's goal specifically in your life is to make you more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we could describe that in a couple of ways. We could think about the sinlessness of Christ, that what God is working in us is a holiness, which sometimes that means we have to have those things taken out of our lives that are keeping us back, that are our, our, our struggles and difficulties that we're going through. Uh, sometimes that means taking us through something you know, you, you could think about it. Sometimes God extinguishes the fire and sometimes God walks with his people through the fire. Right. It's, it's, sometimes he just takes us completely out of the problem and solves the problem. Other times he carries us right through the flames and protects us and allows us to not be consumed. Sometimes. Um. We're delivered quickly, and sometimes we're wandering in the wilderness with for 40 years. When we're wandering, when the people of God were wandering, number one, why were they wandering? Do you remember? Why were they wandering? For, dis for sin. That was a punishment for sin. And yet, did God provide for them through that punishment? The Bible tells us something truly amazing, that their clothes didn't wear out. Anybody have shoes that are 40 years old? Anybody have running shoes that are 40 years old? Um, maybe, maybe you have a really nice pair of dress shoes that are 40 years old. But maybe the entire shoe's been replaced at this point, you know, because they used to do that to shoes. Uh, they used to repair shoes. Um, but um, God provided for them. Even in the midst of their judgment, God provided. We've seen that in Isaiah 42, 43, haven't we? Yes, there's judgment, but God doesn't abandon his people. And so we, we understand that the things happening to us are from the all-wise God to accomplish his end in our lives. And, and maybe that end is not that we become unbelievably wealthy, because that wealth would become for us an idol. Now, that's not to say everybody who's unbelievably wealthy has money as an idol. There have been many throughout church history, very, very rich people that used their money for the glory of God. 